Questions? Let's just do our, we just do our Q&A now. Yes, sir. I just shout it out and I'll repeat the question. <laughs> So, oh, this is a two part question. First, how do we manage, well, some of us have sold the time to overcome those patterns and to rise above those mechanisms that makes other people believe in things are real? And the second part is, how can we deal with those people when that's happening to them? How do we plan the seed of this belief, so to speak, in the brains? Yeah, so this is really the hardest question. Is how, how do we prevent ourselves from being fooled? And then how do we explain to others that they're being fooled <laughs> or that they're wrong? Uh, and that's hard because, of course, we're all subject to the confirmation bias and these other cognitive biases as well. Even being aware that there's cognitive biases, uh, all subjects seem to be able to do is recognize them better in other people. And they still feel like, yeah, but that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> so it is, a, it is a problem. Well, okay, so... Uh, Having some uh, explanation of how science works seems to help. That it is not just knowledge of science in the natural world, but actually understanding how it is that science is done uh, seems to help people understand how their own ideas can be tested in a way. How you can do it yourself is just a peer review. <laughs> that is, just ask your friends, am I going crazy here? Because I just had this idea that this could be whatever it is. Or I'm having some doubts about climate change. You know, what do you think? I mean, should, well, why don't you try reading you know, something like that? So really, it's a it's a social process. So the way you know, the way to keep yourself from being fooled is to have a reality check with people that you trust and know. This is why cults try to get you away from your family and friends so they can isolate you and create a new social world in a bubble where everybody already believes that thing that they believe. Uh, so. This was, like when I was a believer, I was a, a pretty hardcore Christian for about seven years. I was in the bubble. And in the inside the bubble, it all makes sense. It's internally coherent and consistent and reinforced constantly. And, and even though you occasionally hear criticisms, they're immediately squelched and explained away and so on. You never really hear criticisms. Uh, and but once you're out of the bubble, then the world doesn't make any sense at all that you were there. So that's why checks and balances, not only in democracy, but in science, are so important. You spoke about uh, place in the brain that if you poke it, uh, People feel like the God present or, the, or God speaking to them. Has that ever been tried with a hardcore atheist? Like, I don't know. I would well, I lo love to see Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> <laughs> he may be testing that right now <laughs> on the other side. Uh, well, Dawkins went to do the God helmet. He had no uh, effects at all. So I, you know, um, I'm sure it would, in, in the sense if it was a a really strong you know, electrical impulse. I mean, a, a, a rationalist skeptic may say, wow, this is incredible. I know it isn't real, but it's sure, certainly an incredible effect. Sort of like how I, I still get watching spooky movies. I still get like goosebumps and stuff, even though I know there's nothing to it. Like The Ring, did you ever see The Ring? This movie about, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it was just so hokey, but it was so well done that it was, I was alone when I watched it. It was like, oh, it's like, oh, come on, Shermer, you're, you're Mr. Skeptic. You know, this, <laughs> but, you know the, these Hollywood people, they know how to make good films. They know exactly how to cut it and edit and put the music in in just the right areas to trigger your brain to do stuff. So just, I have no doubt it would happen to anybody. Uh, the, the, the advantage we have is that we know something about how the brain works, and so we can reason our way around it. Just sort of try to talk yourself down. Some things are so powerful. I, when I did an fMRI brain scan, had my brain scan just to write about it for Scientific American, um, I discovered I'm claustrophobic, which I never knew. I don't know when this happened, but uh, but to get inside these one of these brain scanning things, it is really small, tight. Uh, you know, the tube is like right up against your shoulders. You got this helmet on and wedges and the goggles, and it's loud. And and I couldn't stay in there. I mean, I. Had, they give you a little panic button. I said, I don't need a panic button. You know, I can handle anything. 
prescription copy of Kim. It's like, you better take it just in case. I was depressing that button. <laughs> I had to leave the room and go outside to get my heart rate down. So something like a panic attack, you, you, you can't control it uh, rationally. It doesn't matter what your thought process is. Uh, Jonathan Haidt makes the example of the, you know, riding the elephant, you know, the, 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 the man on the elephant. The, the man is the cortex. The elephant is the rest of your brain. It's just running the show. And you think you're directing it. You're, you're, you're really not. <laughs> uh, so there's much, there's much research on that that shows we're way more irrational than we think we are, and in ways that we're not even aware of all the subliminal subconscious activity. It's disturbing, actually. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, you said before that it's not only natural sciences, but also democracy that was based on, uh, we could say, a non-believing brain, okay? Um, so, speaking about democracy, uh, sometimes I, I wonder, and um, well, I ask myself, how much of democracy is based on a believing brain? Well, all of it, but the point of a democracy is that uh, A, you can't do anything you want, and B, the mob can't do anything you want. So, well, if you have a democracy, a, a republic kind of a democracy, or a democracy with the equivalent of a bill of rights, or something to protect from uh, what's called the tyranny of the majority. Uh, so, so tyranny of the majority is just the mob rule. Of course, you can't trust mobs. That, that doesn't work either. So you need a pretty strict rule of law and, and uh, a constitution with, with rights that nobody can take away, no matter how big the mob is, so that democracy doesn't go down that road. But other than that, it's the, as you know, it's, as Churchill said, it's the, it's the worst system except for all the others. Uh, but the research on this is pretty good. Uh, if you read Steve Pinker's new book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, it's quite good. Uh, he summarizes what uh, political scientists have been doing for the last 25 years. That is tracking different kinds of governments and their effects on rates of violence, crime, wars, revolutions, things like that. Democracies, two democracies rarely fight each other. It's called the McDonald's theory of peace, right? or Starbucks theory of peace. Two countries that both have Starbucks or McDonald's don't fight each other. Something like that. So trade, open borders between two countries makes them less likely to fight. It's not perfect. Sometimes democracies do fight one another. But the more democratic you are, defined in a very careful operationally definition way of you know, open elections that are fairly reliable and secure, and your vote really does get recorded correctly. There's not a lot of voting fraud. Uh, women have the franchise. Uh, you know, and so forth. Those, those democracies almost never fight each other. Uh, so democracy is a, it's, it's good for that. Uh, and there's good evolutionary reasons for that because uh, we have a dual nature of being selfish uh, and selfless. We, we, we really do like to help our fellow tribe members um, and be nice to our kin and kind, people we know and that we're related to and so on. That makes good evolutionary sense. So if you extrapolate that out so that more and more people are a member of your tribe, that's good. Uh, the, the problem is, is that we're not even close to being there, and so uh, too much, say, empathy isn't good because we're mostly empathetic with our fellow group members. So we're so nepotism still exists. We still favor our own tribe, and so on. So you, there always has to be those checks and balances. And in a way, science is like a democracy. It's like the whole thing on climate debate, and and everybody talks about the it's consensus. Um, you, you know the the worldwide governing body of this. They vote. They do. They vote. Like, what's the best data set we have? They don't vote like, quite like a democracy, but they have conferences and peer review papers. And so on. they come to a consensus. This is what we think is the best explanation we have for the moment. Here's our data set. In a way, that's like a democracy. Nobody gets to just decide that's what it is. It's a whole group of experts. Um, so, and that's why science isn't a faith. You know, it's all you, you just, you skeptics, you just, science is your faith, it's your religion. No, no it isn't. I don't have faith in science, I have confidence because it works. You want to get a spacecraft to Mars, you use astronomy, not astrology. It, it, because it works, not because I like it better, or you like it, or we, whatever, that's irrelevant. And so even though I don't know anything about quantum physics, when Deepak sends me these papers, which he does often, like, ooh, look at this one, look at this one, it supports me. You know, I don't really understand it. So I send it to my quantum physics friend, like Sean Carroll at Caltech. He goes, oh, that's a bunch of bullshit. Here's, here's what this paper really says. Like, okay, thank you. Because uh, I don't know. I can't know anything. None of us can know anything. Uh, and so we rely on the community. 
in a way. So that's, the consensus thing actually is like a democracy. And, and in a way, democracy is like a scientific experiment. We're gonna run the experiment for four years, and then we'll try it again. And we'll tweak the variables, we'll do this, we'll do that, and we'll see what happens. And if it doesn't work, then we'll do it again. And, and basically, it's just a way of saying, we don't know how to run a country, nobody does. It's impossible to know in five years, 10 years, 100 years, what we should do. You know, so let's just have it an open system of constant experimenting. That's like science. So three cheers for democracy and science. <laughs> <laughs> or two cheers, maybe. <laughs> yeah? I, I would like to... Thank you very much for being here. I would like you to, to, if you can tell us a little bit more about your change between being a deep believer and right now being a skeptic. Oh, uh, that's chapter three. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a long story. Sorry, Dan. She's heard this so many times. <laughs> well, it, it's uh, for first of all, I was young, so uh, you know, I became a Christian when I was 17 in high school, and then. And that was about seven years. By the time I was 23, 24, I wasn't anymore. So, uh, and so there's an effect there. Actually, we know about this from the psychology of religion that uh, the less behavioral or cognitive commitment you have to a belief system, the more likely you can change your mind. So, for example, we get letters all the time from uh, people from, let's say, the Midwestern United States. Uh, and you know, I found your magazine in the Barnes and Noble bookstore. Or I found one of your books. I, I can't believe it. I thought I was the only one who didn't believe because they live in these little towns, the bubble. Everybody they know goes to church. Everybody they know at work, their family, their spouse, their kids, everybody. So uh, the chances of that person standing up and publicly saying, you know, I'm an atheist, uh, you know, it's very slim because there's too much to lose. You have a, so the more your commitment is, the harder it is to give it up. That's why, that's why political leaders almost never change parties. You, just can't. Even in science, it's called the Planck effect. Max, Max, from Max Planck, Max Planck's famous quote about it, for a new idea to be accepted in science, the old guys have to die. It, it changes funeral by funeral. Uh, because you know, if you're running a lab and you have grants and, and, and a foundation and, and graduate students and you know, 25 years of published papers, the chances you just all of a sudden go, you know what, I was wrong. I mean, it does happen, but not often. So this is a problem. My case with, the, with religion, it was not so hard to give up because I shifted from being in the bubble at a Christian college to being at a secular university graduate program in which nobody believed, or maybe they did, I don't know, it didn't matter, it, it never came up. And so then I studied, the thing that got me most, I think, was social psychology and anthropology, where it became obvious that everybody believed in God and they all believed something different. That, you know, there's 10,000 different religions, and, thousands of different gods, so many gods, so little time, <laughs> which is the right one? They're obviously you know, geographically based, socially based, psychologically constructed, and uh, so more than anything, I, I think that, did it. you know, so I feel sorry for people that they want to come out of the closet <laughs> and say, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist. It's like, if you've never seen Julius Meany's Letting Go of God, you can watch that on YouTube, it's just several parts. Uh, do, do you know Julia Sweeney, the comedian from Saturday Night Live? So she, she was raised cat. She, so she does monologues. She did one about her cancer. They're very funny, very thoughtful, very warm and engaging. So this one was about her being raised Catholic and then becoming an atheist, and where she finally had to come out to her mom. You know, I, and her mom had read something about how, um, you know, that, how she was an atheist or something, and asked her about it. She, said, well, I don't, I don't believe in God. It's like. Oh, okay, but not an atheist. <laughs> like, you know, in America, atheism has this like whole other baggage that goes with it. And, uh, and then I have another friend who said he wanted to, he wanted to come out as gay to his family, but he was nervous about it, so he decided I'll tell him I'm an atheist, <laughs> and then I'll say no, I'm just kidding, I'm gay. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so, what happens when science cannot give uh, an answer for something? For okay. example, right, big bang, black hole. Uh, what to do 
Big Dick and Go? Uh, right, this is the problem because most people, they just naturally, as I explained, the default position is just assume it's real. And, and, and we're very uncomfortable with uncertainty. The answer to the question is you don't have to do anything. And what was there before the Big Bang? I don't know. You don't know. That's my favorite bumper sticker. Militant agnostic. I don't know and you don't either. <laughs> well, in science, that's, that's okay. Not only is it okay, that's great. That's what graduate students are for. You assign them something that has been stuff. You go figure it out. And then write it up and I'll put my name on it with you. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> so the unknown is okay in science. But, but that takes, some, I think, some practice or some getting used to. For the average person with no training or whatever, if it's a, if it's a fuzzy object in the sky, and I don't know what it is, you don't know what it is, it must be an extraterrestrial spaceship. <laughs> you know, it's not, so the skeptic's answer is always, it's okay to say I don't know. You know, do you know what that is? No, I don't either. Well, don't worry about it. Maybe we'll figure it out, or maybe we won't, but it, UFO just means unidentified. It doesn't mean extraterrestrial. And that's it. That's why I always just say that. I say, you know what? It's okay to say I don't know, and, and just let us sit there. Don't worry about it. You don't have to construct a whole world. You know, the only difference between me and the hardcore ufologist is 5%. The real serious guys, they know all about swamp gas, the planet Venus, and weather balloons, and, and advertising airplanes, and re reflections of, off of water, and they, they know all about those things. And they go, yeah, yeah, 95% of all the sightings are explained. We know those aren't real. But what about the other 5%? <laughs> it's like, what about it? <laughs> You can't explain everything. In science, this is called the, the residue problem. There's always a residue of just unexplained things. I don't know. In any study, you know, the, the effects of aspirin on heart disease, you know, cholesterol, heart disease, whatever. It explains this amount, but it does some other weird things. I don't know. Send the grad students to work on that. So they, I don't know. And, uh, you know, the Bigfoot side, we know most of these, but, they, but the others, I don't know. So there's always a residue of unexplained phenomena that we can't explain. It's okay. Just leave it there. So, and there's the same thing with science. You know, it's like there's anomalies in weather data that the, the climate deniers just glom onto the little anomalies, or and the you know, creationism. You, you, you evolutionists can't explain this little one thing right there. And if you can't explain that one little, you know, the, the left elbow of the frog, how did that get there? And if you can't explain it, that means the whole theory is gone and, and God did it. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean this at all. It just means we don't know yet. That's usually what I say. Don't worry about it. Well, yeah. uh, in all of your debates with uh, Deepak Chopra, um, how is it possible that after, whenever you, or you, you always do, uh, give your list of coherent uh, Logical arguments, and he comes back with backloads of BS and lies and political fallacies again and again and again. Really, what do you find the patience? <laughs> oh, and, and respectfully and patiently can carry on and not punch his teeth out. <laughs> well, um, first of all, it's my day job, so this is what I do for a living anyway. So, uh, but I find it interesting that people believe these things. Deepak really believes what he says. It's not BS for him. In fact, most, pretty much everybody I've ever met in the pseudoscience business, they don't think that they're pseudoscientists. You know, nobody ever in the history of the world said, I'm a pseudoscientist. And today I'm going to my pseudo lab and I'm going to collect some pseudo facts with my pseudo obviously why. But Deepak isn't one of them. I know because when we are alone, you know, when we're having lunch, dinner together, or something like that, he'll, he's still working on me. You know, he's chipping away at, come on, Trevor, let's talk about this, and he'll send me papers and, uh, to read, you know, look, 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 see, see. You know, and then I gotta check in with my quantum friends and go, okay, uh, Deepak sent me, the, don't worry about it, here's what it means. Okay, Deepak, this is what this guy says. And, and so that, I think most people I've met are like that. They really believe. And there's good reasons for that. You're better at it if you believe it yourself. You're better at bullshitting people if you believe the bullshit. <laughs> and then, then it's not bullshit. So then you, you're not giving off the subtle cues that you're lying. So it has to do with lying and lying. Self, self, deception and self-deception. Uh, Bob Trivers' theory, re research on this is real good. He has a, a book out on this. The Evolution of Self-Deception. 
you're, you're better. You leak, there's leakage problems if you're alive. Because if you said, so the problem is there's the cognitive load. Truth telling is easy because you only have to think of, you have to remember one thing. But with the lie, you have to remember two things, the truth and the, the story you told. And maybe you told it differently to different people. And then you got, so the cognitive load builds up, and that distracts you, and so you do things behaviorally that people can pick, pick up on. But if you just believe it, then it's, then it's not a lie. Then there's no cognitive load. So that's how it happens. I think the psychics, they're just goofing around in the college dorm doing readings for their friends. And pretty soon they get a little bit better at it, a little bit better, they get positive feedback. That makes them more confident, and then they begin to believe it, which makes them even better at it, which gives them even more positive feedback from the people, and pretty soon they got a little sign on the, on the, on the street, and they got a shop, and they're doing psychic readings. Yeah, are they bullshitting people? Yeah, but they don't. That, 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 that isn't how it happened. They really believe it. And confirmation bias. They remember their hits. They forget all the misses. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having Seems me. Seems my, my turn. Oh, get out of The boss. Given that uh, I've, I've been for the first time in my life today with you in a table of flamenco, <laughs> I will try an uncomfortable uh, question a, a little bit. Uh, I've been working on Guerrilla Skeptical Zoom uh, project of Susan Gerbic, uh, maybe you know. Uh, in uh, preparing your visit. Oh, okay. <laughs> so preparing your visit, uh, I've been upgrading and making better the, the, the Spanish version of the Wikipedia page of, of you. And uh, I've seen in the English version uh, a rough controversy about uh, something that you don't like, uh, the levels. Uh, there's no, it's not clear if, if you define yourself as agnostic, as an atheist, as a non place So can we, uh, can we agree to, <laughs> to resolve this controversy? <laughs> sure. Uh, right. Well, I usually like to call myself a skeptic because I have a magazine called that. <laughs> so there's practical reasons for it. And also in America, there's a lot of baggage with the word atheist, as I said. So. Uh, it diffuses a lot of stuff. It's like calling yourself a feminist. You know, in America, this is just loaded with all sorts of political things that maybe you believe, maybe you don't. I don't even know what you're thinking when you say the word feminist. Are you a feminist? You know, it's like, well, what do you mean exactly? What is it you're asking me? So it's the same sort of thing. Anyway, basically I say I'm an atheist when it comes to behavior. Is there a God or is there not a God? I don't know, but I assume there isn't. Now. Ontologically speaking, as I said at the very beginning, it isn't possible to know if there's a supernatural being. I, I, you know, the default position is there isn't. So, you know, behaviorally, I just assume there isn't, and I'm an atheist. Ontologically speaking, technically agnostic in the sense that Huxley meant it when he defined the term as unknowable. Now, the other problem with the word agnostic, like when I was on the Colbert Report and Stephen Colbert's. It says that uh, an agnostic is just an atheist without balls. <laughs> well, I don't like that either. So I was like, no, damn it, I'm an atheist. <laughs> a strong atheist. <laughs> and, uh, a strong atheist. Anyway, so, uh, <clears throat> but, but agnostic often means in people's minds, you mean you're kind of still open to it. I mean, you're waiting for a little more evidence that could come in that could sway you either way. Like, I was agnostic about climate change back in the 90s. It's like, I don't know, I'm not convinced. Let's collect some more data. I'll, I'll wait and see. But that is a question that can be answered scientifically. I don't think the guy can. So, very simple. I'm an atheist. So, when, so we maintain the mass in the Wikipedia page. You can just, just call it, he's an atheist. He said so right here in the pub. <laughs> Again, it's just a behavioral thing. You're like, what are you doing? Uh, behaviorally, it's like uh, are you, you know, on Sunday morning. Are you getting up to go to church or not? Well, I don't. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you my favorite quote from Dorothy Parker. Do you know the? the, the sorry, Kevin. <laughs> so somebody asked Dorothy. She was not a believer. But how come she doesn't go to church on Sunday mornings? And she said, "Because I'm too fucking busy and vice versa." 